taste of this new book, Playing the Ghost of Maimonides. It's amazing um, the way poems happen. You heard Jacob Polly speaking about um, looking at TV and being inspired. That has happened to many, many poets. <coughs> I, had, I knew nothing about this guy. I just came across the name, Moses Maimonides. And I felt, ah, that's a beautiful sounding name. Moses Maimonides, medieval philosopher, rabbi, surgeon. And that was that. Then I gathered he wrote this very perplexing book called The Guide for the Perplexed. <laughs> written in uh, classical Arabic, born in Cordoba, when Jewish, Islamic, and Christian cultures met in a flowering space. And I thought, oh, that's interesting. I wonder what such a man like Maimonides would, how he would relate to contemporary politics or the Middle East. And when I say playing, I'm drawing on a carnival type expression. If this carnival in Trinidad or in the Caribbean, you're coming on as a king or, or you know, or a magical, um, surreal fantasy figure, you're playing. You're playing King Henry or you're playing a dragon or you're playing a devil. Playing the ghost of Maimonides. I'll do a few for you. But there's also a jester shadowing Maimonides. People who know my earlier work might think, John, how come are you writing about the Jewish rabbi? And let me just mention two things. I don't think I'm going from my roots. The Caribbean is more complex than you think. The oldest synagogue in the Western Hemisphere is in Curacao, a floor of sand. You can worship silently. There are insects you can keep at bay, and it symbolizes the exodus. And the Jamaican Gleaner, a national newspaper, to this day, they were founded by two Jewish brothers, Jacob and Joshua de Cordova, at a time in the 1830s, just when you had that period between the end of the slave trade and emancipation. So I'll do a few of these for you. The return of perplexed Maimonides, an aroma's throw from Cordoba's olive trees. In the arms of Andalusia's Moorish breeze sits the ghost of one Moses Maimonides. Contemplating this soul-bogglingly complex web called life. Yes, he's thinking to himself, what next? Maybe I'll modernize my guide for the perplexed. A Jew writing of the perplexed in classical Arabic, even a ghost, can perplex both ends of orthodox stick. The thing is to couch your words in the prophetic. From Jerusalem to the seat of Damascus, Eagles of steel shall come, swarming like locusts, and weeping shall sound from the stones and the dust. Strike a sphinx-like note. Keep the believers guessing. They'll soon be falling at your feet for a blessing. Failing that, turn to the art of jesting. So say to the charity givers, Give without a fuss. Let the donors learn from the best poets among us. In short, let your giving be anonymous. Risk a beheading. At best, a barrage of booze. But that's how believers express their views when they hear the truth told slantingly true. Say to thy tongue, all oh, my momodies suggest. Say to thy tongue, I don't know, and thou shalt progress. Then he crosses his Isaiah fingers while holding his breath. Having no reason to disbelieve divine reason, he thinks this too will come to pass. The fanatic's season then again, how long is a piece of string? How long? 
Some rabbis with beards as grey as their Torah may regard this apparition as a heresy sower, a sort of crossover, biblical whistle blower. How trust a man who learns from whirling Sufis and mixes God's word with scientific theories picked up from ones who face Mecca on their knees. How can silence be prayer and darkness light? How compare Jacob's ladder with Muhammad's flight when no ladder's the same in that right? A rabbi like him of eagle-eyed renown should be rooting for the messianic march of Zion. Tell us, Maimonides, whose side are you on? And he who by acronym was AKA Rambam would recall the golden age of medieval Islam when Jew and Muslim breathe in one breath of Adam. And he who was physician to the Sultan of Cairo and neither considered the other as high or as low now contemplates on the telly an inferno rising from an apocalypse of breaking news. But when bilingual bombs speak Arabic and Hebrew, should he answer to Moses or Rabu Musa Ibrahim Mayum? Ah, for those days beside Cordoba's olives, when the most perplexed mind knew the meaning of live and both rabbi and imam could spell forgive. We inherited part of the nonsense tradition as growing up in what was then British Guyana. So the jester um, uses a nonsensical touch in some of his responses. So the jester's post-war reflection. They bombed our tongue. So we bombed theirs back. We bombed them flat. It's called tit for tat. We bombed their tongue, so they bombed ours back. They bombed us flat. It's called tit. For that, who will be left to mourn for tit? Who will be left to mourn for tat? And this is the jester's eureka moment. How do you fuse a Muslim and a Jew into one? Is a question the jester would many a day brood on as he squatted on his Futon. At last, a win-win solution. Since flesh dwelleth in the world, I'll start by changing my name to Abdul Abdullah Goldberg. <laughs> or simply Suleiman. Suleiman. And under my Yarmulke dome to holy Mecca I shall roam, seeking Kaaba in Kabbalah as I do my salam, shalom, from dusk unto dawn. May the mind's credos be exiled from the orchard of my heart, and may Yahweh and Allah smile as I whirl down the aisle with my chosen Gentile. And when reckoning day comes, and this jester bursts into atoms for being one of God's scapegoats, may yours truly be timely bombed, not by one side, but by both, and from folly's ever-blossoming bed. Let wisdom regather itself bud by bud, of course, easier said than done when dogma wags the mind by the tail and heart forgets the scent of the trail.
and the jester has his own way of relating to certain biblical sayings. The jester confronts the Almighty on separating the sheep from the goat. A sheep and a goat fell in love at first sight. And their coupling frolics were each other's delight. The farmer transfixed shook his head and said, This is done right intolerable. Those two are inseparable. If sheep and goat keep at it, and their genes interbleed, they'll soon be parents to a shoat, or who knows, a possible geet. Dear God, you know it's hard enough separating the chaff from the wheat. So pray tell me, how do you propose I separate the shoat from the geet? The elephant is having a senior moment. <laughs> What's called short-term memory loss. That is to say, the elephant can't remember whether it drank 10 gallons of water today or got through 40 gallons yesterday. Somehow this morning is already a blank. He's forgotten what he's had for breakfast. Whether bark, leaves, or twigs by the ton. Yet his long-term memory is fiddle fine. He can take you as far back, as far back generations, and recall that stampede 50 years ago when just a lad he trumpeted with the herd and taught those ivory hunters terror's lesson. Oh, it feels like yesterday and still makes his trunk glow. <laughs> My Maimonides discourses on the fifth of the four humors. Mm -hmm. I, I wanted to write a poem, it's almost like mini sermons or mini discourses, <coughs> the way in those old fashioned novels they say, Dear reader. So my is addressing his students on the fifth of the four, four humors. Some modern scholars scoff at Hippocrates' four humors. Dismiss them as medical folklore. I've observed how they lapse into a wry smile at the merest mention of phlegm or yellow bile. But I propose a fifth humor, i.e. God's humor. Oh yes, God isn't averse to a good belly laugh like the time when he inspired Balaam's she ass to speak unto Balaam. Why smite me three times in only three footsteps? <coughs> Balaam was gobsmacked, but charmed by the beast with the cross on its back. God laughed till his almighty limbs almost cracked. But what really cracked him up beyond his own will was the creation of the platypus's one-off bill, <laughs> derived from, wait for it, the Greek platypus, meaning flat-footed and sounding like humus. The platypus emerged into God's party piece. Please note I refrain from saying masterpiece. I dare say You'd also be laughing your head off if after devising the neck of the giraffe, you'd come up with something even weirder. Imagine limbs of an otter, the tail of a beaver, feet webbed like your average duck, 
the creator felt a falling into a rare state of laughter. He patted himself on the back and uttered, well done me for rolling mammal into bird. In conclusion, I suggest after my own fashion that the fifth humor is a form